Everywhere Jesus went, he attracted followers. And people would come from the villages from miles and miles around when they heard that Jesus was in town or that he was out teaching someplace, whether it was by the sea or in the countryside. And they'd follow him for days on end at some times. There's lots of different reasons why they followed him. For some, it was because he fed them. And we have the uh, several accounts in the Gospels of where Jesus fed 5,000 at one time. For others, they followed him because he was a healer. And again, in the Gospel records, we find that people would bring the sick and the demon-possessed to Jesus to be healed and to be set free. And they would trek for, for miles just to try and find him so that they could get healed. So there's lots and lots of reasons why people followed Jesus. Women liked Jesus because they were treated as equals and there was respect. Children liked to be with Jesus and, and he would play with them, he would pay attention to them. It wasn't the kind of thing that rabbis or teachers would kind of do. But Jesus did. He played with the children, he respected women, he taught those who followed him. So wherever he went, they found hope. They found hope in Jesus. They found hope in the message that he was preaching about the kingdom. And there was something about the way that he preached, not just his words, but also the miracles that followed, is that Jesus came and preached the kingdom and then demonstrated that kingdom. Out of the multitude that followed Jesus, only a few became disciples. The disciple is different from a follower. This one. We follow people on Facebook and Twitter and other social media channels because we like the things that they say or they do. In other words, we, we follow them for what they can do for us. Now a disciple is also a follower, a follower of Jesus, but not in the same way as we are followers on social media. See, a disciple doesn't just follow Jesus. Can do the disciple actually has a deeper penetration and an insight into who Jesus is. And that's the reason why they follow Jesus. So the call to be a disciple, everybody, everybody's called. It's, it's an open invitation, if you like, from, from the Son to become a follower. But not everybody is willing to pay the price to become a disciple. Disciples are ones who Jesus entrusts to continue his mission on earth. That's why he said in the Great Commission to his disciples to go out and make other disciples. See, it's to disciples that the mission of Christ is entrusted to. But there's a cost to discipleship. And the cost is to become like Jesus, to be patterned after him, to do the things that he did in life, and to be an imitator as we've mentioned in the last message. And that has a cost. And the cost that Jesus talks about is to take up the cross and follow him. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This passage of scripture is an interesting one and is worth unpacking for a moment here. The word to follow that Jesus uses is the word akalutheo in the scriptures and it doesn't mean to follow as in following after him uh, or even to uh, you know sort of be a follower like follow Jesus on Facebook or something like that as if we could but um, it actually means to be a disciple to follow as a disciple would follow a rabbi or follow a master it means to imitate the master in everything that the master does not just in the things the master says, but in the way that the master behaves as well. So the idea is that to follow in his footsteps is to follow so closely behind the master that uh, in Jewish thought, 
um, there was a saying uh, about the dust of the rabbi falling upon his disciples. And the reason for that is because they were following so closely behind the master. The dust kicked up by the feet of the master actually collected onto the clothing of the disciples that were following. That's how closely Jesus is asking disciples to follow him. But there's another uh, part here in this passage which talks about not being worthy. And that word to be worthy has an alternative meaning that can be to keep in step with me. So there's that, again, that idea of following in the steps of Jesus so closely that you are in keeping in step with him. So the context of this Matthew 10 passage is Jesus is just about to send the 12 disciples out into the countryside, into the towns, into the villages, and to all the other places in that particular region. And he's telling them to go out and to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. In fact, to continue doing exactly what Jesus had been doing already. So again, this idea of following the footsteps of the master is that you begin to do the things that the master does. In this block of instruction that Jesus gives to his disciples before they go out, he also gives them a warning about what is to come. A warning about what it is to be a disciple. That if they're going to be a disciple that's going to follow in his footsteps, they need to expect that there's going to be persecution. Because persecution followed Jesus and his mission. Because we have an enemy and the enemy wants to scupper and thwart the plans and the purposes of God, no matter who they come through, whether it's through Jesus or through his disciples. So Jesus warns his disciples that they too would also be persecuted, that the leaders of the synagogues wouldn't like what they're talking about and would flog them, in some cases would kill them, and they would be, uh, they would be, they would be oppressed no matter where they went. He said that also, if you want to be my disciples, you have to expect the fact that sometimes even your family aren't going to like it and your friends aren't going to like it or your work colleagues. Jesus said the student is not above the teacher, nor is the servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like their teachers and the servants to be like their masters. So he warns his disciples that if you want to be an imitator of me, if you want to be like me and if you want to do the things that I do, if you want to have the same mission as I came into the world to fulfill, then you've also got to be prepared to take the flak. In other words, you need to be prepared to take up the cross and follow me. So an alternative translation of that warning passage could be that if you don't imitate me by holding fast in the face of persecution, then you're not keeping in step with me. But if you do keep in step with me and you do face persecution, take courage because you certainly won't lose your reward. The commissioning of the disciples wasn't the only time that Jesus talked about taking up your cross and following him. There are other passages in the Gospels which talk about this uh, from Matthew and from Mark. And these particular ones in Mark, Matthew 16, verse 24, and in Mark 8, verse 34, Jesus is standing with his disciples, but now he addresses the crowd. And he talks to the crowd, and he gives the crowd a call to become disciples, not just the select few, not just those who Jesus handpicks, but he gives the invitation out to everybody. And he says to them, whoever wants to freely and willingly to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross 
and follow me. So in the Matthew passage, Jesus gives this invitation to everybody who's there to come and to be disciples. And again, he talks to them and he says, you need to take up your cross and you need to follow me. He's talking about the cost of discipleship. What is it gonna to cost to actually be a follower of Jesus? Because Jesus doesn't want to do a bait and switch. Jesus doesn't just tell people what a great time it's going to be being a disciple. The rewards are fantastic. Isn't it awesome to be a disciple? And then, of course, when they become a disciple, they find that actually there's costs involved. It's actually, in some cases, going to cost people their life. Now, that would be a classic case of bait and switch. But Jesus doesn't do this. Jesus is open and he's honest to the crowd and to his disciples, and he warns them. You're going to have to take up your cross. There's going to be hardships if you follow me. And then Jesus goes on and tells them and shares with them the kind of things that he is going to have to endure. Now in this Matthew passage, Jesus is taken aside by Peter. And Peter, of course, being the disciple who, uh, who is the go-getter, uh, you know, he, he takes Jesus and he starts to rebuke Jesus. And he says, Jesus, how dare you talk about dying? This isn't for you. This isn't what we signed up for. You're actually going to become the king. You're going to be the savior of Israel. You're going to be the one that's going to, going to come in and kick the Romans out on our behalf. Of course, that famous passage then is that Jesus waits till Peter has fully inserted foot into mouth, then rebukes Peter himself in that famous passage where he says, get behind me, Satan. Is it the things that you have in mind are the things of people, the things of men. You don't have in mind the things of God. Jesus, when he talks to disciples, is very much saying that if you're going to be my disciple, you need to be about my purposes. You need to be about my plans. And you need to have my kingdom in mind and not the things of yourself or the things of this world. The cross in this context means to submit your thoughts to the thoughts of God, even if it means at the cost of your own life. It's interesting that where Jesus was crucified is the place of the skull, Golgotha. The place of the cross is the place of a crucified mind and a crucified thought life. And it isn't just that we learn as disciples to think right thoughts and to reject bad thoughts. It actually means to submit your entire thinking, to submit your entire mind to the plans and purposes of God. It means that I don't follow my own way anymore. It means that before where I would have planned to have done things for myself or done things my way, it means that I take those things before the cross and I crucify those things in order that I might take up the cross of Christ and do his thoughts for me. Ultimately, God has a higher purpose for us than what we could possibly work out or even imagine. And it, preservation of the self-life, those thoughts that we have to save face, to save our honor, to save ourselves from shame, uh, to make sure that we excel in life, all those things, uh, they're, not, they're not really bad, but, uh, but they're all about self-preservation. And that self-preservation life, if it becomes an idol, if it becomes the thing that, that we focus on more than anything else, it's actually a trap. And it's a trap that Satan places for us. Because the enemy is always seeking to keep us focused on the self-preservation, that self-preservation life. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. The surrendering of the self-life is an act of trust that God knows what he's doing more than what we know. The fact that he's our father and we are his children and he knows what's best for his children. The disciple says, Lord, I'm willing to go to the place of crucifixion where my self-life will be put to death that I might gain the resurrection life of Christ in its place. And that is the place of the cross. It's that glorious exchange. Our meager self-life 
for Christ's glorious resurrection life. Now, that's a good trade in my mind. In Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Now, the context of the Lucan passage here is that Jesus warns that he's going to the cross and that he's going to die, similar to the Matthew and the Mark passages. Now, he says, deny. A disciple denies himself. That means to disown, to disown oneself. So here the context uh, that Jesus is talking about to his disciples is that if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be one who follows after me, you have to disown yourself. That means give up ownership of yourself. Jesus then is preparing his disciples for what comes ahead. So Jesus, when he went to the cross, of course, opened up the way for all people, all peoples of the world who would receive him as Lord and Savior to become sons and daughters of God. And that actually means to change ownership. It means to become a son or daughter adopted into the family of God. So a disciple freely gives up the right to determine their own way and to accept ownership by Jesus, by allowing the Holy Spirit then to determine the course of their life. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So a disciple is one who accepts the ownership of Christ and his lordship in their life. And by accepting that lordship, it also means to accept or to give up the right to be self-determinant. Luke emphasizes that Jesus talks about discipleship being not just a taking up your cross once, but actually to take up your cross means to do this daily. So being a disciple means to take up one's cross daily. This isn't something that we do just once. It's not, you know, like salvation, where we accept and receive Christ into our life. And that's a, a once thing that we do and we're born again. To be a disciple is a daily walk. And a daily walk means that we have to have in mind the things that Jesus wants us to do as a disciple, as a daily basis. It means that we give preference to what Christ wants done in our lives on a daily basis. It means that we don't just do the things that please ourselves, but we always be looking to please the master. And then the sense is what it means to take up your cross. There is self-sacrifice involved in being a disciple. It isn't just all sweetness and roses or butterflies and rainbows or unicorns, if that's your thing. But, uh, but there is a cost, and the cost is, is the giving up of that, that self-life in preference for what King Jesus wants. So is taking up our cross only uh, about persecution? Is it only about being willing to face hardship that comes to us from external sources? I don't think it is. To take up your cross really means to embrace any form of hardship and being a disciple means to be a disciplined one. And so being disciplined means that we have to take control of our flesh life, our desires to have an easy life and to uh, pursue life, liberty and happiness uh, is the American way and uh, instead is to give up our time and our effort and our energies to be disciplined, spiritually disciplined, in order to become the kind of people who are able to imitate Christ in thought and word and in deed, so that we actually become disciples. The attitude 
of a disciple is to get up in the morning and say, Jesus, today is your day. Will you have your way in me? And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Every disciple has a cross to carry. And being a disciple isn't just about being disciplined and it isn't just about bearing up under persecution. Jesus also requires a disciple to have uh, a fully invested heart emotionally. Verse 26, uh, the previous passage there in Luke, says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now the word hate this is a very strong word and probably needs a, a little bit of unpacking here. The word is miseo and it means to regard with less affection or to love less. In other words, Jesus requires that the love, the emotion, that uh, connection of heart that a disciple is required to have with Jesus is actually to be greater than even your closest family members, and even the love that one has for oneself. Therefore, the call to be a disciple is to be not just fully committed in a physical sense, but to be 100% invested in Jesus, the person of Jesus, to love him, and love him more than we love ourselves, our spouses, and in fact, our family. Verse 28. In verse 30, we're asked to count cost. Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish, everyone else who sees it will ridicule, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Again, Jesus isn't here with a bait and switch. He says, if you want to be my disciple, count the cost, because there is a cost involved. To be a if we're just looking at the costs and the costs alone, then probably nobody would become a disciple of Jesus. But Jesus, of course, not only just wants us to be aware of the costs involved in being a disciple, but it's also important that we know the rewards of being a disciple as well because the rewards are great. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, Paul says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You see, Paul, when he was told uh, at his conversion the things that he would have to suffer for the sake of Christ, he was also shown the glories that awaited him afterwards. And when he weighed those things in the light of eternity, Paul, he says, when I look at all the things, and he was a guy who'd been flogged, he'd been beaten, he'd been stoned, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been without food, uh, he'd been without a place to lay his head. Uh, Paul has suffered an enormous amount of personal uh, cost when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus. And yet, he's able to say that in the light of eternity, in the light of the rewards that face us in glory, these are just light and momentary troubles. Hebrews 12 and verse 2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus himself understood the glory that awaited him. And because of the glory that was coming afterwards, he was able to endure the cross. He was able to go through the pain, the humiliation, the personal suffering, but also the spiritual disconnection from his father, who he'd never experienced before. All those things Jesus went through because he understood the glory that awaited on the other side. My encouragement to us as disciples, 
when we're contemplating this notion of taking up our cross daily and following Jesus, that yes, there is a cost, there is a price to pay. Yes, it does mean that there are some things that I'm called to do as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple, that other people are at liberty to do. There are things that I restrict myself voluntarily in doing because of the sake of Jesus. Because I know that in paying the price, the weight of glory far outweighs any personal cost to me. I know that when I stand before Jesus, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to open his arms and accept me into eternal glory. And that is far, far outweighs any cost that I might personally have down here. Even if that means losing my own life, a disciple can't love his life more than he loves Jesus. And so, although we're not required to do that here so much in Canada, there are people in the world today that to be a disciple means to lay their life down. It means to be prepared to go to prison, to be tortured, and even to lose their life. And these are our brothers and our sisters, and we need to be praying for them. So think about eternity. Think about the glories that await you because they far outweigh the short, the temporary, the light and momentary afflictions that you might go through now as a disciple of Jesus. To summarize the things that we've been saying about counting the cost, about taking up the cross, a disciple holds fast in the face of persecution and opposition. A disciple is one who surrenders their will to the Father's will. A disciple daily imitates Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And a disciple has counted the cost and fixed their eyes on Jesus for the glory that awaits them. And Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. You know, sometimes we uh, want to pick up other people's crosses and nail them to it. But Jesus says, no, you need to be nailed to your own cross. There is a cross for everyone. It has your name on it and it's tailor fitted just for you. It doesn't fit anybody else. And it's not built for comfort. But those who embrace it will find the strength to overcome. My encouragement to us all is that no matter what cross we need to bear, it's worth it. It's worth it because the rewards of knowing Jesus, the rewards of being like him, not just in this lifetime, but also in the next, they're worth it. Jesus, I don't think, would ever ask any of us to bear more than what we can bear. And he certainly wouldn't ask us to bear anything if he wasn't prepared to give us the same Holy Spirit that was in him, that we might also bear the cross that we're called to. It just wouldn't seem right for Jesus to ask us to bear a burden that's actually greater than the reward. So my encouragement to you is don't see picking up your cross as being a negative thing, but seeing it as an invitation to even greater glory. God bless you.